list. Aha. Mm. Yeah. Our today um, lecturer, Evelyn Kostacher, with a very interesting, at least for me, and I hope for everybody, with a very interesting talk about in situ spores and pollen. Evelyn, please. Thank you very much, Natalia, for inviting me. Now, this is a talk in combination with Hendrik Novak, who is a postdoc uh, currently in, in our institution in the Museum of Nature, South Tyrol. And this is a, I'm speaking about the project that we're currently doing. So we, it's something like work in progress that I'm showing you. So what we want to study is the botanical affinities of several uh, spores and pollen that we can find in fertile material from plants of the Triassic of the Southern Alps. Now, when we study or when we see climatic or environmental re reconstructions like here from the Anisian of the Dolomites, we normally are used to use spores and pollen for it and use them for identifying environments, different climate signals, sea level change and so on. And or we are used to do dealing with macro fossil record that gives us a lot of more information than just about uh, the, uh, the abundance, but because it, we can see a lot of information also about how the stomata look like, how the plants look like, so how they are adapted to different environments. And of course, the best thing would be to combine the two together, especially because they give a lot of information about what's going on. Now, most times, however, we only have spores and pollen when we look into the fossil record because those are of a much higher resolution and much more abundant in the, in the sediments than plants fossils. So often we are related to that, but depending on how well we know about our spores and pollen, depends our, also how good our reconstructions of paleo environments, paleo climates, and so on will be. Most interesting is when we look at the spores and pollen that we can find dispersed and we compare that one to the type of plants that have been found in situ to, or at least the plants that we think they belong to. And as you can see here in the list, always from the Anisian of the, of the Southern Alps, you can see that a lot of the spores and pollen we know of are of different, let's call it preciseness in understanding how they are linked in, with their respective plants. So we have some cases where we know the spores that come directly from their, the plants, but you have a lot of uh, spores and pollen we have no clue about, or we can only infer that. That's because, uh, and then normally once we have an idea of where the plants belong to, so what botanical affinity they could have to, we would use that one and move the plants back into their respective environments and the change in this environment, as well as the change of abundance of the plant in their respective environments would show us information about environmental change, climatic change, and so on. In order to combine sort of the plants on one side and the spores and pollen on the other side, we have two possibilities. One is that we compare our morphology. So for example, we use a fossil a pollen that we can find by the cut pollen, and then we try to search for the most closely related one among the extant or more, among the more recent spores and pollen. And due to the concept of uniform tourism, we consider that perhaps the plants that yield the fossil pollen was of the same or similar environmental requirements as an extant respective. Much more solid is if we really find the spores and pollen inside of the plants. Like here, if you ha we have Apicopterus lobatus uh, from Nagolnik, from the Permian, and on the lower side, you can see the sporangia attached still to the lamina. And if you take, over, uh, take up the different sporangia and macerate them with Schulze, for example, what can happen is that you can get out, if you're happy and the, the preservation is good enough, you can get out the different sporangia 
and you can open the sporangia and extract the spores from them. And then, of course, you can study those spores or pollen, depending if it's if a gymnosperm, of course, and see how you can link those to the, the spores, uh, spores and pollen concept or that you can find in the sediments that yield that plant. Now, here's a typical example, again, from the knees and of the dolomites. What you can see on the left side is a strobilus of Selaginellitis, is, an, is a lycophyte. And you can immediately see that you see a lot of dots, dark dots in there. And if you take those or this organic material out and macerate them, what comes out of it is that one, what you see on the left, on the right side, which is on one side sporangia with microspores, and of the other side sporangia or fragments of sporangia with megaspores, telling us on one side it's a heterosperm a plant, but telling us also something more what type of spores were created by that plant. So we can open up the different muscle or the different sporangia and then look into detail and see what type of microspores and what type of megaspores have been created. And if we go one step further, then we can look, as I said, into the sediments and, for example, find the corrospective dispersed spores, which in this case is ubisporides, and then we can link ubisporides to the plant, which is an isotalian plant in this case, uh, sorry, an selaginellalian plant in this case with selaginellitas. But we, of course, we can also infer the environment because we can see what type of environment that single plant was living in, in case we are directly finding it in situ, or we can compare it to extant uh, plants which can have a similar habitat and they have a similar growing system and say, okay, it's normally a creepy plant. So it, uh, uh, and the type of creepy plants would live in a humid understory. So the environment it reflects is a humid lowland environment and the, hu the signal it would reflect, especially if I find lots of them could be a humid environment or sigma or a climate sigma. So this directly links uvesporides on one side with selaginellitis on the other side, and by inference of the two gives us the climate signal, which is humid. Seems very easy, the whole stuff, if it's not a little bit more complicated, because what can happen is that you look at different, uh, different plants, like here, Gorgonopteris, and two species of Columpendrides, and if you macerate them and get the spores of pollen out of it, what you can see is that all of them create the spore, uh, spores that are belong, let's say, belong to the genus Punctatisporides. Now, okay, all of the three of those species are Osmondaceous, but they probably live still in different habitats. So one type of spore is not always exactly the same as one type of environment. So we have to be very careful about that if you look at this dispersed pollen record. Taking a, a different example for the region of the of Wüstenwelsberg, which is in Germany, you can see Deltoidospora, which is quite abundant in the dispersed for record. And if you look at the botanical affinity, we know that uh, Deltoidospora has been produced by a different uh, and diff, uh, various um, families of ferns that have been living actually also during the region. And several of those have even been staying in the region or in different localities they have been found, like Tamatopterus, Dictyophyllum, and Phlebopterus, and also Clatropterus can yield deltos, Deltoidospora, according to the general understanding. Now, of course, those are plants that live in different uh, habitats, and depending on which plant we select, the link to make between Deltospora and the plant, it would give us a slightly different habitat as well. So we have to be very careful what we do. So what you can do then is look where it has been found in C2, especially from the same locality or from the same area. And it has been found in C2 in Dictyophyllum exile. So, and use that environment in this case, in order to be sure that you don't move it to the, to the wrong environment. Even to get anything a little bit more complicated, 
there, for example, Sophie Lindstrom showed us in, in the 1997 paper mm -hmm. that sometimes you can have a single pollen sac from, in this case, a Glossopteris plant that can yield different type of in situ spore, uh, pollen. So the different morphologies that you can see on the right side have been all extracted from one single pollen sac and would be put by specialists of the dispersed pollen record into different genera. So actually it's very important to understand which plants would produce what kind of pollen and spores, because of course, in this case, all three of those uh, genera that uh, Sophie would find dispersed in the fossil record would then later on belong to just to one single uh, plant actually, and was actually also reflect just one single environment. And of course, also climate signal. So as you can see, depending, of course, the more you go back, the worse it gets, the, depending on the level of information that we have, we can have completely no information about the plants. So for a lot of spores and pollen for the Triassic, we have still no information of in situ material. And we have perhaps not even an idea where it belongs, really belongs to, if not to a general lycophyte like fern group. So what we saw is that it would be very important to go more into detail and in this case, combine the, uh, the understanding of a palynologist, which is Hendrik Novak, and a mostly palybotanist like me, in order to have an, uh, a combined understanding of what we're looking at. And in order to do that, we selected the Triassic of this Eastern Southern Alps due to two things. First of all, I'm living there, so I have material from there and it's easy to find, but also because we have a very high resolution of, um, of uh, different formations where we can find spores and pollen dispersed, but also plants from the same horizons that we have to disperse pollen record from, and we can have a lot of good preserved material where we can try to extract also material. And here you see already the first group, so it's Equisititis mugiotis or the horsetails, and you can see some strobili nicely preserved here on the left, or two strobili, uh, two strobili of course, in this case, uh, attached to the axis. And when we macerate them, we get this poor spores out of it. And sometimes, of course, they're immature. Sometimes they could even be present some part of the first sporangia still with them, but we can extract them, we can study them, and we can describe them as if we are in the dispersed pollen record and then compare them. So in this case, what we have is a roundish subtriangular spore with a trilead mark. It has small verruca on top, especially on the, on the proximal side. What we are looking at is probably mostly immature specimens in this case, well, because we see some part of the osprunger still attached. They are relatively small with 30 to 45 uh, micron in diameter. And if we would look in the dispersed pollen record, which we also have, we would uh, move it into or would determinize it as a granulatis sporidae. If we go further, we can, for example, do the same thing with flycophytes. Here you have on the left side have Isoetitis brandnei, an entire plant with the roots, the entire plant preserved and, and, the, plant, and the leaves spirally attached. And here you can beautifully see how the leaves are enlarged in, in the lower part. And in this enlarged lower part, you have the sporangia. And then you can macerate the whole material and try to get out of it. And you will see, in this case, you get megaspores and you get sporangia with microspores. And if you look at the megaspores and you would describe them as an oval to circular, the exine is convolute to vercate. You have a trilid mark, which is not always quite good visible. They, they are quite big, of course, they're between 270 to 300 microns. And if you would need to describe them as a palynologist, then you would uh, assign them to the genus Verutrilatus. On the other side, if you look at the, uh, at the microspores, you, here you, again, we have some immature 
spores still attached together, forming a part a fragment of a sporangia, but still you can see they're roundish, so slightly oval in shape. They seem cavate, they are smooth on the, uh, on the outer side, but sometimes they are some punctate that we can see. They're between 300 and, uh, 35 to 40 microns in diameter, and especially, mostly interestingly, they have a monolith mark, telling us that we would uh, assign them to the genus Aratrisporidae. Let's move to the ferns. Here you have a beautiful specimen of Gononopteris laurige. It's an almost entire leaf. It's about 30 centimeters long. And you can clearly see the dark, darker spots on the leaf, on the lamina, which are those uh, pinny that are fertile. Now, what you can again do is extract the material, treat it, and then what we get out, also in this case, slightly immature material here, but we can easily see it's a trilid spore. It's circular to slightly oval in, in shape, let's call it. It's quite on the big side, it's 45 to 60 microns in diameter. And normally they are smooth on the, on the surface, but sometimes they have just a little bit of sculpture. But we think that the natural texture is that of the smooth uh, facies, and we would call it a toditis boridis. <laughs> then another group, this time from Lunds, from the canon of Lunds here. You see again the, the leaf or the leaf fragment here with the, pin with the pinules. And if we extract the spores in this case, we get some trilead circular spores out of it there. You can clearly see the vericate ornamentation. They're about 50 uh, microns in diameter. And uh, so far they are mostly obtained as a cluster, but you can still see that not completely immature anymore. So they're quite good. And you compare them as you can see them here with vericosis variety. So we can li clearly link the plants with, with their respective organs as well here. Here is Anomopterus mugioti. Again, if we take it, if the, we take the spores out of the material, we get this slightly immature clusters still there. But what the spore look like is they are mostly circular or sometimes a little bit oval in shape. They are about 40 to, to 60 microns in diameter. They are smooth. So rarely, most times a slightly vericate surface, and you would assign them to the Osmundesitis. Then let's move to the Maratielis. Here again, we are in Lunds in the Canyon, and you can clearly see here the pinny with the beautiful groups of sporangia on the lower side. And you can easily detach those sporangia and, and macerate them. And if we look into detail of what those spores again, what you can see is that they are circular to a slightly oval, most cases, most circular in this case. They are pseudomonolith to pseudotree leads, so they have one fissure and then something like attachment to get with it. The quite large dimension range, as you can see, is between 30 and 50 microns. The, the xin is quite thin. They are slightly infragranulate or smooth to microvericate. And if you would assign them as a dispersed palynologist, then you would assign them to Lushiki spores. Staying with uh, going to the Dipteridaceae, here we have Cryptoropteris. And uh, what we have also here, dispersed pores, they are trilead, they are rounded um, to triangular, they're slightly concave sides, as you can see. They are quite sm on the small side, so between 20 and 35 microns. They are slightly uh, microreticulate or vericate. Sometimes they have short baculae. And if you would assign them on the dispersed spore record, then you could call them Luncisporitis passes. So just in order to give you an idea as well here, we can have a look at just the dimension. Have a, let's see what happens there. And you can see the different 
uh, uh, samples that have been taken and a different type of, sp uh, of spore species that have been taken. And you can see that there is quite some variability if we take the different samples. So there is quite some interspecific variability in the various species. And um, we can even look it further up and you can see that if we look the relationship between the dimension and the length of the aperture, that there is quite a strict relationship. But of course, what we can also do is having a look in detail about the morphology and then look whether or not we have some grains that, that are, let's call it a little bit more unnormal. So we can have some spores that are smaller, apparently are not completely developed, that are deeply folded, that have much more folds inside, that have not be as well defined or apertures or that are just slightly more smaller but are still in the sporangia. And a lot of those things, if you would look at them in the dispersed pollen record, then you would call them abortive grains and you would normally use the percentage in order to stress whether or not there have been perhaps some environmental conditions like during mass extinctions or volcanic activity that created a stress to the plants. Now, what we have here are plants that are very happy and living during a time period where there is no major stress known of. So of course, those plants have also a natural percentage of spores that are created or abortive, let's call them, spores that are created. And Hendrik tried to figure out in some of the species in this case here, Dictyophyllum and Todides, whether he could see and differentiate them in different groups. So on one side, normal spores, which are just within the normal range of what you can see and what has been described as dispersed spores. Then some parts that are probably or for sure abortive, so they are not looking as you classically would expect them to look like. And then some taxa that are clear, clearly abnormal. In order to understand how high the percentage could be of this not normal spores that the plant just naturally creates and that we could expect to be in the fossil record as well, in the dispersed fossil record as well, even without there being any stress involved. Now, if we move to different groups, we have here a very strange pl uh, plant that we have no clue even from the macro fossil record where it belongs to, it's called Lugadonia paradoxa, paradoxa because we have no clue about it. And what also can happen is that you have, in this case, a fructification with in situ spores or pollen, we assume it's a, it's a spore, but it has a very strange outer surface around it. And that has never been described actually dispersed in the fossil record. So that we cannot link it to anything which we can find dispersed in the fossil record. So probably it is not the final stage as how it was then later on deposited in the sediments. So we are not able yet to figure out how it looked like. It could be of course that this outer surface that we can see covering our spore is falling off later on, so it's not persisting in the fossil record. And we would look, uh, in the fossil record, we would find only the inner body, which then would be described probably like a todisporidae type of thing. So we have also to, sometimes to be keep in mind that one, so about preservation of all the tissues that are produced by the plants during ontogenetic stages. Then, just an idea also, we mostly have worked so far on the fern spores, as you can see, uh, but we had a quick look also on the gymnosperms already. And here, for example, you can see on the left side, a beautiful cone uh, of a conifer cone. And on the right hand side, you can see the pollen that have been extracted from it. And as you can clearly see, it's a bisecate pollen, it's tenuate, it has a monolith mark. 
This sakya, pretty small in this case, closely attached to the central body. And what we would call like is normally Lurkisporidis and Luna or Lunatisporidis. Now, what we to be uh, careful about is that Lurkisporidis and Lunatisporidis are known from the Triassic, but often very rarely, and are generally considered typical Permian pollen in the fossil record. And there are some groups of people who believe that each time you find Lurkisporidis or Lunatisporidis in the Triassic, that is only because it has been reworked. So they think that because we, fi we find it, it's because it's, it's some old Permian material that has been reworked because so far it has been described only from the Permian of, for example, the Southern Alps. So it must probably then be reworked. Now, as, we, as you can see here, we can find it in situ, demonstrating that the plant that was creating Lurkisporidae and Lunatisporidae, which is a conifera plant, probably survived the mass extinction and is still living happily ever after in the Triassic and producing its pollen. So the pollen record that we find in the Triassic is not a reworked pollen record, but is rather a pristine one coming from the plant that just survived. Here, a beautiful example from another conifer, which I want just to show you, which is Walzer recubiensis, which is a plant that is actually sort of endemic in the Southern Alps. But if you look at the slab to your left side, what you can see that we have the shoots attached to the cone, which is often, well, let's say it's rare in the, in the gymnosperm following record. So normally you have the, the you have the pollen organs, so you have the cones, which are detached from the plant, which fall off and are disp found uh, dispersed in the pollen record and not found it attached to its producing plant. But in this case, we have it attached, so we know perfectly well what the plant is looking like as a, as a plant, let's call it. And we have the, the, the cones as well, and when you can see on the, right, on the right side of the cone, you see they are beautifully preserved. You can even count the pollen sacs in there and you can macerate the pollen sacs. And the pollen that come out, come out of it are bisacate pollen with a small trilead mark, which are on smaller sides, so they're between 45 to 60 microns in diameter. And if you look at this pollen record, then you would call them a, a triadispora. Now, in the pollen record uh, from the same locality that we have found the cone in from, you will find Triadispora as a bisacate pollen, but you can rarely also find uh, Triadispora as a trisacate, so one sacchi more pollen. And if uh, it was described, of course, as a different species, it's a different species name, but if you look like for example, here in the studies of Benka et al from 2018, we know that for example, UV um, or also other pathogens may create malformations in pollen records also of excellent plants. And for example, in this case, it has been used to reproduce malformations in pollen by exposing um, a pinus plants to anhydrate um, UV radiation because they wanted to recreate the, uh, the possibility, recreate the idea of the PT boundary. So about some disturbances that happens at the PT boundary and by which one of the things was high and high uh, UV radiation. So plant is very stressed. And as you can clearly see in the bottom, the plant produces quite abnormal numbers and dimension of the sake. So it can, they can be bigger, they can be smaller, they can be higher number, they can be in an abnormal position of the pollen. And sometimes you can even have that the plants don't divide completely, but they are still attached together. And 
by looking at the pollen record at the Bini boundary, Benka, Cindy, and Cindy Loy and colleagues found out that they could find similar stages also in the dispersed pollen record. And an increased amount of this malformations of good gives you an information about environmental stress, but it can also be that a, a certain amount, as I have shown you with this poor record, uh, especially, is created just normally by the plant due to some meiosis that are not going as they should go. Of course, in a small amount of uh, amount, but they are produced. And of course, we have no way nowadays to find out how high the percentage of malformation is naturally created by the plant if we are not looking into sporangia, so pollen sacs, and count them in order to see how many of those are really belonging to the abnormal, strange pollen grains or spore, spores. Uh, we can do that, of course, with excellent plants. We cannot do that with pollen records, but we of hope to do that with our pollen records soon as well. So when we look at in situ spores uh, or pollen, of course, we can see a lot of information. We can get a lot of information about those plants. So we can study the ontogenetic stages. So see how the immature plants, uh, pollen spores look like and how those evolve through time in order to obtain the mature ones. Of course, when we look at in situ material, we more often will find immature ones because those are the ones not fallen off the sporangia against really mature ones because there's almost already fallen off and often we then only find the empty sporangia or the empty pollen sacs anymore. But it is even important to understand how high the diversity within one single species is in order to understand how many of the different spores and pollen that we will find in this first rock record and call them different species or even genera names actually belong together to one plant. On the other side, by studying the in situ spore record, we hope that we will be able to find characters which can us which permit us to more clearly distinguish between different groups of plants in the sense of seeing which are the markers or which are the characters that are shared by a lot of groups or shared by a lot of genera and species of plants and which are those characters that perhaps we can really use to distinguish also and use them in, this, in the dispersed pollen record. We hope that once we find out how the normal, sorry, how the normal consider, uh, conditions are of E. sporangia, we can also infer better what characters are really inferred by ecological and climatic stress. So once we know how many plants are producing abortive or how many, how high the percentage is of abortive spores and pollen a plant produces in under normal conditions, we can have a higher possibility to understand when things are showing us that there has been an ecological or a climatic stress and not just use perhaps some data that we can find and infer it as a stress of environment just because it's in the right levels, let's call it stratigraphic levels. So what does the plant look like or what type of spores does the plant produce without stress permits us to understand when and what type of spores and pollen are created when the plant has stress. 
And of course, last but not least, well, that's our main idea of doing this project is that by considering all of those characters and all of those informations that I've given you now, we would pref hope that we are better in the future in linking on the one side the spore and the pollen record, which is dispersed in the sediments with the respective parents plants. Because by doing that, we get a better reconstruction for Triassic environments and Triassic climate signals. And we will for sure be better be able to identify and differentiate between a environmental signal or a climate signal if we know better how those plants, oh, what those pollen are, by which type of plants those pollen are produced. Because in this way, of course, our information is much more sure, let's call it, and we can, the, the step from going from the pollen to a climate reconstruction is much safer than it is nowadays. Because as I have shown you before, at least for the Anisian, I would not say half, but I think one third of the pollen record, we have no clue what it, what it belonged to. And of course, if those groups are, which is often like ovalipolis or so on, those are the most abundant ones in your pollen record. The information that you have when trying to infer climate and environmental signals is really risky. Let's call it like that. So I hope that by combining on one side a polybotany and on the other side polynology, by directly finding them together in the sediments, and on the other side to combine a poly polynologist like Hendrik with a, somebody who's wor mostly working on polybotany like me, but well, I know I work also on palynology, as you know, a bit, uh, permits us to help in the future or help future Triassic palynologists to understand better how the climate changed through time. And for that, if you have any questions, I'm here and Hendrik is here as well as I've seen. Harun, thank you so, so much for your talk. And we are waiting for a question. Anybody who want to ask are welcome. I have a small question about slide uh, with ratio of normal and abortive polynorgan with, uh, uh, with person of normal grains or abortive. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand uh, the samples uh, on this plot, uh, the same age of locality or different age. I don't understand. Um, this oh, one? This, is, this one, yes. Next. Uh, the, this one? Yes, yes. yes. These yes. are all the same age. Uh, same so age and same the sa locality. The same age and same locality. So those yeah. are just different samples, meaning mm -hmm. that those are different specimens, but, but from the same age and the same locality. So that was just one try that we had, or ANSI. What was one try that um, Hendrik did, because those were the ones that were most productive, because we wanted to be sure that the number that we were counting was high enough, and that we had enough different specimens in order to compare it, because you can see how different, here you have one, two, three, four, five, six specimens, mm -hmm. which are stored in three different localities nowadays. So those, these ones are in stored in, um, the first three, are, uh, the first two are stored in Vienna. And then there are three from Berlin and then one from Stockholm, but they're always the same locality and the same species. And 
you can see how different the the percentage is even sorry even with one single sporangium or one single specimen mm -hmm. if you compare it to each other so if you watch would just take one of those and most let's be honest in most cases we have one further a specimen and we just take that one and study that one and think we know everything about it and we we really wanted they can see also here we really wanted to have a lot of different um, samples in order to see first of all whether we can see ontogenetic stages and whether we can see some differences which could be just because this plant was three meters to the right or to five meters to the left from the other plant or something like that. So that we have really a spectrum of the plants themselves. So we did not just select one. So I, I think Hendrik uh, macerated or, and looked at some tens of material from ferns in order to create this. And all those that, which were not productive enough are not included. So we are, I don't know, Hendrik, how many ferns did you analyze for the paper? How many specimens you mean? How many specimens, yes. Um, I'm not sure. I am, well, in terms of samples, hmm. at least it was uh, uh, about 80, I think. But uh, of course, many of those came from the same specimen. So to clarify, so with these numbers, the ones with the dash and one, two, three at the end, are from the same specimen from different points. Different positions on the leaf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can also compare those and also for the abortive grain. So you have the, uh, that was also one of the interesting things so that, uh, especially for Dictyophyllum serratum. So the, the three samples from the one specimen from Berlin in this case, or the one with the Those MBPV three. number. So this one had uh, so the highest rates of abortive grain and also had some uh, other abnormal types, so which did not show up in the others. So this shows us that this uh, really uh, reflects the state of the plant as a whole. So it's not just a local defect in this case. And uh, yeah, by comparison, so the... Um, so of course we did not have uh, good, so high numbers of uh, good spores from all the specimens that we, that we sampled. Uh, in many cases, it was just too little to really make, uh, so to determine this uh, frequencies. Um, but in these cases, so, so we still see a bit of a pattern here. Uh, I have a, a small second question, if, if I can. Uh, and uh, how frequent frequency of malformation pollen uh, grains changes uh, change in different age and the throw time? Uh, uh, yeah, we yeah. don't. Yeah, I, I understand <laughs> your question. Uh, yeah, Eugene. yeah. I uh, we don't have yet that information, so we don't have enough. Um, same. same species from different times yet. So we hope to get some of those as well. So to answer that question at some point, but for the, mo for the moment, we don't have that many uh, good, okay. so let's say abundant enough in situ material in order to answer your question. But this is a, a project that started something like one year ago now. And we mostly it has been delayed due to yeah, to COVID. Things, yeah. <laughs> Just due to our friend COVID. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, uh, of course, the laboratory was closed for a time and we could not do all the processing and all the analysis that we wanted yet. But at some point, we hope to answer also those questions. So whether through time we see different amounts of, for the same species. Okay, thanks. Thank you. You're I welcome. Have not a question, but a comment related yes. to malformation and aberration and so on. It would be great to, to check it on modern counterparts, not just um, something similar, some ferns, because I think that natural aberrations are quite numerous and they occur rather often and we can understand something about the level of aberrations looking in modern plants. 
you're completely right, Natalia, of course, yes. But we were just starting with it because we were looking at it and was saying, oh, there are some things in there. And since nowadays, as you know, a lot of people are working on teratologies, malformations in combination with, uh, especially with mass extinction events. We were starting to, to have an, uh, an eye open for those things and we did not yet get that start, uh, stop, um, step further, but you are completely right. Of course, we have to compare it also with extant ones. Well, more questions? Uh, yes, I have a very simple one about your deltoid dyspora. If you uh -huh. can get the slides, uh, which one, Han? The the deltoid dyspora, where you have various plants producing it. Okay. Yep, another one. Where was it? Yep. That this one. Yeah, that one. Yep. Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know which slide it was. Uh, there you have Dictyophilomexilae, Thalmatopteris, all fine. Dipteridaceae, mm -hmm. Matoniaceae. Uh, mm -hmm. Matoniaceae are usually distinguished by a bit thicker margo around it, but that is uh, mm -hmm. questionable. But the, my problem with the whole thing was Clatopteris meniscioides. Because mm -hmm. what I have seen from in situ spores not from our own work because they they were not very well preserved, but other studies is that they are much more granulate, which is strange in Dipteridaceae. Dipteridaceae usually have like the Dysphora, quite smooth spores. Mm -hmm. Same for Matonius AC. Now this has always intrigued me, uh, so it's one of the things I I would really uh, like to uh, for follow up. If see if there are also from other uh, areas and time uh, is is better material and what the spores look like then. You are completely right, but mm -hmm. here the, the idea was only to show that we if we take deltoid spore and use the botanical affinity as it is. Oh yes, yeah, I agree. You generally yeah. used, <laughs> then we would use every of each one of the dipteridaceae and matoniaceae, and if you look in the region, then we have for. Uh, four possibilities, or like say, let's say five uh, with, uh, as a species. And if yep. you look into the environmental signal, you would completely go a different signal and go in a different direction. Yeah, 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 I, I, one I or the other. No, that's not the problem. So, but you are completely <laughs> right. Of course, I agree that Clotropterus, as we have found it so far, does not yield the typical Deltodospora type no. of things. No. But no. It, it, it's still, it would be included as a, as a general idea. Mm -hmm. okay. So at the moment, but okay. so we what we need yeah. to do is 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 publish it and describe it properly in mm -hmm. order that people know that those are out of the mm -hmm. spore. And of course, what what we're hoping for is that Stefan is sending us more material, and mm -hmm. he promised some much more material, fresh material, and that mm -hmm. we can have a closer look into yep. those four groups. In any case, that would be great. Because Stefan they, promised something about uh, sending some material over. Yep, but the, the 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 main problem there is that there isn't all that much. Most is just co compression fossils without uh, sporangia mm. uh, being uh, there. But let's hope anytime he finds something, he can send it. Yeah, he sent an email the other day, something like we found something. Uh, <laughs> send it. Yeah. So we hope for that one to come over and then mm. with a bit, oh, bit further. That, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, and the question right. for Hendrik, did you do anything on the samples I, I sent you uh, after the paper was more or less finished? Not yeah. yet. It's, oh, yes? It's, okay. it's in the lab. In okay, the lab. Great. Okay. Because I, I wonder if it, if it agrees with all the other things we found out. So it's, it's done in the lab. Okay, great. Thanks, Hendrik. Well, more questions to Evelyn or Hendrik? Well, if not yet, I have more, one more question to Evelyn. Well, what is your idea about the immature state of pollen and spores in for in situ material? How do you think that this is a mature spores of pollen or this is an immature spores? Well, one, th one thing is that often you get it Somebody needs to switch off the, the microphone. Okay. Um, so one thing is often if they're very closely glued together, if they don't have their, the, the marks uh, devolved, 
good, good enough. And uh, if they are very mature, then often they they quite easy to disaggregate, and you can easily take them apart and study them easily. So if you, for example, try to make the slides, get them easily apart. And sometimes they're really glued together. And um, what is also sometimes you can see that um, there are some structures coming off, but they are not completely develop, developed yet. So you get a feeling about the things that, yeah, it's something like you get a feeling about at some point that you, you, you see that the material is not yet done. So you, you have the, the, the thing that you have the structures, but those are not finished structures. Let's call it like that. They look not finished. Mm-hmm. But it's not not easy because uh, often you need to see a lot of material in order to get that that in, that feeling out of you, and uh, and of course if you take it from different positions in the in the in this in the front for example, then of course if if you see that those that there are some perfectly granulate structures on one side and there are not there are and more on the bottom you get some material which is not completely granulate yet then you have to know that that's because it's more immature, not because it's mm-hmm. something different. So first criterion is uh, spores are glued together, but can it be because of the preservation, because of the fossil state rather than because of the maturity? That can be, but then all the fossils, uh, all the in situ stuff would, would be glued to, uh, of the same horizon, of the same bed and of the same locality would be glued together. But if you have only some, some of your fragments that are cl- more closely glued together and others are quite going off nicely and they're all coming from the same horizon and some formation, then I wouldn't expect it to be a single preservation of one specimen. It's, it's rather the bat that preserves in some way. Mm-hmm. So what I, can... I, I like your second criterion that if several uh, sporangia in one corner show different spores or pollen grains, different state of uh, readiness. This, this can be a good hint. And a, a third one would also some always be compared with the dispersed fossil record. Mm. Because if the plant produced those spores and pollen, and if we presume that it's not being dispersed by insects later on, it has mm-hmm. to be there. It cannot be not Mm -hmm. be there Mm -hmm. at all. Well, what else I think about the immaturity is that this quite often can be overestimated because um, if spores and or pollen grains are already monads, they so that means that they passed most of the ontogenetic stage they should Mm -hmm. have passed within the sporangium. And Mm -hmm. so if they are in glues, but they are monads. They are near, at least near mature. Sure, sure. Uh, can, I, right. can I say some add something as well? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I learned from uh, Luc Adon and Alice Tryon that when they looked at living fern spores, that the immature ones had a few characters. Of course, quite often the perispore isn't yet there because the perispore is the very last thing that is mm-hmm. being deposited on the spore, but that's only for spores. Secondly, that the trilead or monolead mark is not completely straight, but sometimes wavy. Mm-hmm. And, and thirdly, that there are sometimes around the trilead scar, small holes, but you can only see that under uh, uh, SEM, small holes where the, uh, from the sporangial wall still material is being de- deposited on the, uh, on the spores. So those things, it, it's very good to, if you consider working on that, to, to go to uh, people who work with lit- the, indeed the excellent material mm-hmm. and uh, ask them for those things. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to use the first one, very spore, because it often is not fossilized, is not preserved, <laughs> or uh, perhaps it is destroyed during maceration. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah. the others are, should be considered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, for instance, the doing work on uh, in situ 
the Jurassic material, uh, Dixoniaceae, uh, you could very easily d distinguish those uh, those things like the slightly wavy twilight scars and, and those holes around it. Mm -hmm. And it was I... almost, almost mature. Mm -hmm. Well, anybody else want to ask something or to, to comment? I do not see. Perhaps that's all. Okay. Well, I'd like to <laughs> to point out one more thing that I usually would like to point is that the application of electron microscopy is very important. Well, and, I, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I agree. I'm, yeah, I mean, if you cannot by this or that reason to apply it now, it is so good to, to keep the possibility for this, to keep some, you know, some macerated spores and pollen somewhere nearby the, um, the sample for, for future <laughs> paleontologists, morphologists who we hope will come and study it someday. We have some material <laughs> left. Yeah, and yeah, we that's great. Keep it there, yes. And if you want to study them, you're always very welcome, Natalia. Yeah, I like one. Sorry, I like all your presentation, but one <laughs> slide in one all slides I like particularly much. I'll write you about. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. Well, if we finished with the questions and the discussion, so one more thanks to Evelyn and Hendrik for their presentation. We were happy to, to listen to you today. Thank you for everybody who has come. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks to Jason Hilton and oh, thank you hi Jason yeah yeah Yeah, hi, Evelyn and Natalia. Hi, Jason. Thank you very much yeah. for the chance to attend the talk today. I don't usually attend seminars and things. I just thought I'd come in today. So if there's other things you have in the future, I'm quite happy to come along. I think the oh. world is getting smaller now we have the internet. So COVID um, brings us many bad things, but it also brings us good things. So I prefer to focus on the positive here. <laughs> and if you want specimens, if you find pictures of sporangia and spores in papers from China, and you want contacts to get the samples, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Great. I think okay. if you want certain yeah, time yeah. periods, Dong Shenghui in the Petroleum Ministry has got masses of collections and is a palynologist. Mm -hmm. He would probably have lots of things to give to people to work on. Great. Thank you for the option. I, we will think about it. And uh, in fact, there will be more um, workshops at our seminar, but usually they are in Russian. If you are able to listen to the Russian talk. <laughs> it's, so I, if we can do